I invite you to turn with me this evening again in the scriptures to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 1. We read from Revelation chapter 1 this morning. And we do encourage you, if you want to, if you visit our church website, www.carryduffpc.org, you could listen to that sermon. Uh, That sermon's about the proclamation of the true worshiper, based in Revelation chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. But tonight, uh, there was a text of scripture when I was studying um, Revelation chapter 1, verse 5 and 6 that caught my eye. Uh, And uh, that's what I want to try and bring to your attention uh, tonight. Uh, I have to confess uh, that um, while I was on parade uh, in Loch Gaul, uh, one of the uh, young men that was with me um, said to me, "Uh, are you ready for Sunday, Reverend McLaughlin? And I said, well, brother, this man is a Christian. I says, would you believe it? I'm walking along here and the mind is full of what I'm thinking about in relation to the Lord's day. Uh, And it was on this particular text of scripture that I was meditating in my mind. So let's read from Revelation chapter one. Remember, it's the revelation, not revelations. It's only singular. The word revelation means the unveiling. So think of that as we read. Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, reading, of course, from the authorized verse. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you, and peace from him which is, and which was, and which is to come. And from the seven spirits which are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness. And the first begotten of the dead. And the prince of the kings of the earth. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold he cometh with clouds. And every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps, with a golden girdle. I'm going to end the reading there at verse 13, but I would encourage you maybe tonight, later on, before you go to bed, to read again at Revelation chapter 1, right down to the verse 20. Now, my text tonight is taken from Revelation chapter 1 and 
the verse 7. It reads as follows, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. And my theme this evening is the consideration of the second coming of Jesus Christ in power and glory. And if you look carefully at verse 7 and listened to the reading of the words and have read them twice in your hearing, you'll learn something else about Jesus Christ. He's not just our promised Messiah. He's not just the prophetic, priestly, kingly mediator, but he's also a powerful majesty. Here's a biblical fact. Jesus Christ is coming again. That, of course, is the blessed hope of the church and earth. And, of course, that's the same hope that the church triumphant has in heaven. If we believe tonight and live in light of the blessed reality of Christ's return, our souls should be filled with joy, our minds should be instilled with peace. And despite all the turmoil that's happening in the world, despite all the lawlessness that's out there, and all the ungodly things that have been done and said, we should be focused on and fixed in our hearts and minds on this glorious reality that Jesus Christ is coming again. Now, let me try and tell you and teach you three things tonight, if I can, from this text of Scripture. Look at the words. Behold, he cometh. I want you to think tonight about the personal return of Jesus Christ. The word he refers to Jesus Christ. That's the context. Look at verse 5. And from Jesus Christ. Jesus, of course, refers to his humanity. Christ refers to his ministry as the promised Messiah. We're told something about him, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh. You see, it's not an archangel. It's not someone else in the place of Christ. It's not a, a substitute. Behold, he cometh. It's a reference to Jesus Christ. And remember in the context here, he's a faithful witness. He is not a false witness. He's not a false prophet. He's a faithful prophet. Didn't he say in John 14 and verse 3, If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And remember at his ascension, whenever he was resurrected bodily from the dead, we read in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 1 and in the verse uh, 11, a tremendous statement by two angels that were with Christ. And this is what they said unto his disciples. Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. And of course there's no need to reinterpret those words. We're not saying anything else but what is based in biblical truth. And it's this, that these words, behold he cometh, refer to the visible, personal, bodily, literal, tangible return of Jesus Christ to this earth. And the Bible says to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there's no light in them. And if I can put it contextually, because Christ is not only the promised Messiah and from Jesus Christ, 
And because Christ is not only the mediator of the new covenant, and if you think of the, 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 the context here, um, John uh, is, is writing to the seven churches that are in Asia, and he makes this statement, grace be unto you and peace. And, and who's it from? And then he mentions from him which is, which was, and which is to come. And from the seven spirits which are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ. You see, there's a reference to the Trinity. Grace and truth do not appear out of nowhere. Grace and truth flows from God the Father, the one which is. That means he, he is infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in his being. Which was, which is to come. And, and it flows to us also from God the Spirit. The reference to the seven spirits are to the, the Spirit of God that is a, a sevenfold manifestation or sevenfold aspects uh, to all his perfection. Seven, remember, is the number of perfection. And it flows from Jesus Christ in his mediatorial role. Because Christ is the mediator. He is there for the faithful witness, the first begotten from the dead, the, the, the prince of the kings of the earth, the one who loved us and washed us from us, our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests uh, uh, unto God. To him be glory and dominion uh, 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 forever and ever. He, because he's the mediator, he will come again to this earth. You see, the, here's the point. The doctrine of his second coming cannot be separated or divorced from the doctrine of his first coming. The second coming is part of the outworking of his first coming. And therefore, the return of Christ as King of kings and Lord of lords to this earth is sure and certain. It's going to happen. And here's this wonderful text. And in the course of a doxology, as John bursts into song, thinking of who Christ is, he adds this. Behold, he cometh. In 2003, Hollywood produced a, a film. It was called Lord of the Rings. It was a three-part trilogy based on a book by uh, Tolkien, uh, who was a friend of C.S. Lewis, who lived in Belfast, by the way. I, I've never read the book. I, I don't think I saw the film. But I'm told that the third part of the trilogy was called The Return of the King. And you see, that's biblically based. This is not just some fantasy. This is not something that, that has come out of Hollywood. This is not something that a film director has produced in his mind. This is not a make-believe story. This is factual. This is true. This is sure and certain. This is going to happen. One day, Jesus Christ will personally return to this earth and his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives outside Jerusalem. Now, think about those words, behold, he cometh. I want you to think, secondly, I want you to think of this, not only the personal return of Christ, but the practicalities of the return of Christ. Look at the text. It says, behold, he cometh, with clouds. The word behold is used in the book of Revelation 27 times. And the word behold is not just the ordinary word for see or for look. It's a very strong word in the Greek. If you think of the corresponding text, behold the Lamb of God. It wasn't just to see him with the eye or look upon him. It means to, to gaze upon him in such a way that in your mind you're gripped with an understanding of who he is in his person and work. And as you think about the practicalities of the return of Christ, there's a witness here to the certainty of his coming. Behold, he cometh with clouds. There's no doubt about this. If you look at your Bible, turn over there to the book of Jude. In the book of Jude, we read in Jude verse 14, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, 
prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. Now, Enoch, of course, is mentioned in the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis is the book of beginnings. And here, near the end of our Bible, we read a bit of information that's never been disclosed before. The Holy Spirit didn't reveal it in the beginning about Enoch. But here it is, the Holy Spirit has told us that in his day, he went about preaching, he, he predicted, he, he prophesied the certainty of the Lord's return. Because he says here, at Jude 1.14, Behold, the Lord cometh. And, and he identifies him. And he tells us how he will come with ten thousands of his saints. If you turn over to the book of Job, Job was a contemporary of Enoch and Abraham. In other words, he lived around the same time. And in Job chapter 19, and in the verse um, 25, Job says, For I know that my Redeemer liveth. That's a reference to the resurrection. And that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. That's a reference to his second coming. Did Job believe in the second coming of Christ? The answer is yes. And, and I could go on tonight adding reference upon references because there are loads of references that all make prophetic announcements about the second coming of Christ. And just as his first coming was literally fulfilled down to the minutest detail, so the second coming will also be literally fulfilled down to the minutest detail. So just don't think about the personal return of Christ, but think of the practicalities, the outworking of it. It's absolutely certain. And I want you to think of the authority of his coming. If you go back to Jude there, Jude and verse 15, ask yourself this, why is Christ returning to earth? What's his purpose? What's the goal, the mission? Here it is in part, to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. You see, this prophetic event has as one of its purposes to mete out justice and judgment upon the earth. Christ is coming to deal with sin and to deal with unrepentant sinners. And one of his great purposes in coming is to exercise and execute judgment upon the earth. Now, of course, that's the testimony of others in the scriptures. Over there in Thessalonians, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, the apostle Paul said to the church at Thessalonica, and to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Now let me just give you another reference. This time it's in the Psalms. Turn over there to Psalm 96. For this is not just a New Testament concept. This is something that's throughout the Bible. In Psalm 96 and verse 13, the psalmist said this. Before the Lord, for he cometh, for he cometh to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the people with his truth. And this is in the context, let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let the sea roar in the fullness thereof. Let the field be joyful and all that is therein. Then shall all the trees of the wood rejoice before the Lord. Why? For he cometh. For he cometh to judge the earth. 
Do, do you see that? The reference is to the whole of creation rejoicing at his coming. Why? Because when the Lord returns, he'll deliver creation from the bondage of corruption that it experienced in the fall of Adam and us in the loins of Adam. Romans chapter 8, verse 23. The Lord is coming to judge the earth. And the apostle Paul, he also made an amazing statement in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and in the verse 5. And it was in relation to the second coming. And this is what he said, Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the heart. And then shall every man have praise of God. You, you think of the Apostle Paul, how he was wickedly maligned by men, how they said hurtful and nasty things about him, Offensive things about his eyesight, about his speech being contemptible, about his baldness, and so on and so forth. And, and how did Paul react? You see, Paul was content to lay it before the Lord. Paul was certain of a day of judgment to come. Paul, therefore, was content to wait. And his counsel to the church was. Judge nothing before the time. Why? Because vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I'll repay. The Lord will come. And the Lord will execute judgment. That's one of the purposes of his coming. The Lord will visit his people. The Lord will vindicate his people. The Lord will uphold the principles of true righteousness and justice. And I've said this to many who have experienced the loss of loved ones, especially during the dark days of the Troubles in Northern Ireland. People who have had loved ones murdered or uh, blown to bits and they never found bits to bury. And it's hard and difficult for many within our own community. And, and we have to say to them that when Jesus Christ returns, one of the, the things that he will do in returning is that he will execute true judgment and justice upon the earth. Now, now think also in our text, and I have to be quick, behold, he cometh with clouds. Think of the majesty of his coming. You see, when we think about the clouds, we probably think of the atmospheric clouds. And it could be a reference to that. But it also could be a reference to the supernatural clouds of power and glory. Remember what Matthew says in Matthew 24, verse 30. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and glory. Power and glory. Is not that a contrast to his first coming? In his first coming, they were the days of his humiliation. He came largely unknown. He was born in Bethlehem's um, Stable. He, he, he was laid in a manger. He, he, he was largely unnoticed. Uh, a, a few shepherds and a few other individuals involved. He, he was hated and despised and rejected of men. They sought to slay him. He was the object of scorn and derision. He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. The Bible says we hid his face from him. And yet when he comes again, what a contrast. He's coming in clouds, clouds of glory and power. You see, I put it to you tonight, Jesus Christ is not just a good teacher. He's not just a great example. He's not just a, a moral teacher. He didn't become God after his birth or become God during his life, as some teach. That's a lie. He was eternally the Son of God. He is God of very God, bone of our bone and flesh of our flesh. And when he ascended up into heaven, as Acts 1 and 11 tells us, he ascended up in clouds. And I'm not just convinced it was atmospheric clouds. I believe it was supernatural clouds, the clouds of power and glory. And he's coming back in the clouds. Behold, he cometh in the clouds. Not just the certainty and the authority and the majesty of his coming, but also think tonight of the visibility of his coming. Here's another particular. It says, if you look at our text, and every eye shall see him. 
You see, the whole world is going to see it. It's not a secret coming. It's not a silent coming. The, the Bible talks about the trumpet shall sound. The Bible talks about the last trump in 1 Corinthians 15. The Bible knows nothing of a silent, secret, invisible coming of Christ. This is a very public, visible event. And I want to say tonight, and I say this lovingly, he did not come spiritually at A.D. 70 as some teach. Some teach that he came spiritually to the world to destroy the temple and destroy the city of Jerusalem. Others teach that he came spiritually in about A.D. 430 to destroy the Roman Empire. Even think lately of a man called Harold Camping who, who taught that Christ came spiritually on May the 21st, 2011. And of course, I reject date setting. I don't know when precisely Christ will come. All I know is coming. And that's what the Bible teaches. And over in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 36, it says, But of that day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Only God knows the hour and the day. I can be content with the signs that God gives. I believe that his coming will be visible. Isn't this a, a coming that the church longs for? Doesn't the Bible tell us there in the book of Revel or the book of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 28? So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. And you're maybe thinking tonight, well, how can every eye see him if half the world's in darkness and the other half's in light at the same time? You may be thinking, well, how could the dead see him? Of course, the dead will be resurrected uh, when the last trump sounds. The dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And of course, we, we, we'll return. And, and is not the teaching of 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 and 17. You see, this is a supernatural event. God himself has power to bring it to pass. I believe the word of God. Every eye. That's the eyes of the unbelieving world. The eye of the Christ rejecter. Not one of them will be excluded. That's the eye of every believer who's alive at the coming of Christ or who has died in Christ. You think tonight of Revelation chapter 6, verses 12 right through to 17. And the Lord Jesus Christ, as the mediator of the new covenant, remember, breaks the seals of the book. And he breaks the sixth seal. And we read in Revelation chapter 6 and verse 12. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal. And lo, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair. And the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell onto the earth. Even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs. When she is shaken of a mighty wind. I want you to pause there. I want you to think of that because I also want to read again from Matthew 24. And this is what it says. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. You see, Christ, remember, is the one who is brighter than the sun. And what happens when he appears? Yes, there'll be cataclysmic events. Events so terrible that the ungodly themselves will feel it. And if you read Revelation chapter 6, it says, And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens, and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us, 
and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come and who shall be able to stand? You see, not one will be able to ignore Christ. Today he's ignored. Today many have no thought or regard for him. They live as if he doesn't exist. But in that dreadful day, every eye shall see him. And it will be a day of mourning and weeping and wailing. I want you to think not only of the personal return of Christ and the particulars of the return of Christ, but I want you to think of one final thing. The power of the return of Christ. If you look back at our text, it says something, and this is what caught my eye again when I was on parade in Scarva on Friday, and it was this. And they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. You see, the return of Christ personally, visibly, bodily, and tangibly to this earth is going to have a powerful effect. There'll be those who'll wail because the Bible says here, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. And there'll be those who welcome him. Even so, amen. Now, the word amen means so shall it be. All kindreds refer to the inhabitants of the earth who will wail because of him all over the world. There's going to be a wailing because of him. Now, why will they wail? Here's the answer. Because I believe that it will be a recognition that their day has ended. That their life is about to be cut short. That their time on earth is finished. That they'll not be able to live in sin any longer. That they'll not be able to live in rejection of Christ anymore. And the word wail uh, means to be cut to the heart. It it, it refers to a bitter wail. It it refers to a a strong cry. If you remember the the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. Uh, And of course, that that means that he, he wailed. As they say in Bush Mills, to use that terminology, he, he was born and greeting. And, 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 and that means the tears were flowing down their face. And you think of the proud heart of unbelievers. How that when Christ visibly and personally returns, how their hearts are laid low. And this is a wail of hopelessness. Time shall be no more. This is a wail of despair. It's not a wail of repentance. It's not a wail of getting right with God. This is a a, a bitter awareness that's come to their understanding that their life of sinning is over and it grips their hearts. You see, that's how men react. Remember what the Apostle Paul says if you uh, turn just uh, with me to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. It says... For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in the darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Now, now that's the context. They're saying peace and safety. And isn't that the quest of the nations of the world tonight? Why do they want peace and safety? So they can go on with their sinful lifestyle. So they can go on believing that there's no such thing of a judgment to come. So that they can go on believing, well, there's no such person as God. And, and heaven and hell, well, that's part of the fairy tale and fairy story. And, and, and they live without knowledge and focus on the person and work of Christ. But once they see him, they'll wail. And it'll be a hopeless, bitter, despairing wail. Why? It'll be a wail of anger because of the way that they live. Notice the words. They also which pierced him. You think of those that crucified Christ. The Christ rejecting Jews and Gentiles in the first century. 
and those who are still crucifying Christ in a metaphorical sense because if you think of the many that have rejected him since down through the ages and they discover Christ is real Christ is alive Christ is reigning Christ is going to judge us you think of those that have defied God they've tore up the Bible and they, they, they've effectively lived a lie and, 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 and they've told themselves that death is not the end. And they, they, they have lived for earthly pleasure and earthly possession and earthly possessions. I want to tell you tonight, if you die in your sins, die without Christ, one day your voice will join the wheelers. And it will be a hopeless, despairing angry wail from your heart because you'll discover time for me is no more and all I've lived for I'm taken from it and what awaits me a fiery looking judgment I want you to think of not only the wail because of rejection but very quickly a welcome because of reception think of these words even so amen the word amen means so shall it be now, now, turn over quickly there to one final reference, and this is the end, Revelation 22, and in the verse 20. He which testifieth these things saith, this is the Lord Jesus, surely I come quickly. That, that's what he's saying tonight to the church. Surely I come quickly. And here's the response of John. Even so come, Lord Jesus. You see, when John thought about the whalers, he was thinking about those that are going to welcome Christ. Even so, amen. You see, it's a test of the heart. It's a test of your true spiritual state. Do you welcome his return tonight? Can you welcome his return? Are you a true child of God? Do you love his appearing? Are you looking forward to his appearing? Do, do you live in light of that day? Are, are you hastening that day on in your heart and mind? Can you say, even so come, Lord Jesus? And you know that, yes, you'll be taken from all that you know and have lived for in time, but, but you welcome that. But tonight, if you don't welcome that, if you can't, then your heart's not right. You're not ready to meet him. You haven't been redeemed and washed in the precious blood. You're not in a right relationship with God. And that's your urgent need. To go to Christ. And repent. And say, Lord, I'm sorry. God, be merciful to me, the sinner. Lord, save me, I perish. And I want to tell you tonight, if you repent and believe the gospel, Jesus Christ will receive you as one of his own. And when he returns... Whatever happens, you will be with Christ. As I've said before, if you're in Christ and live for Christ, through the strength of Christ, you go to be with Christ, which is far better. That's a test for your heart. Can you welcome Christ at his coming? That's the power of his coming. Will you be among the welcomers? Or the wailers, only you can answer. May the Lord bless these few thoughts to your heart this evening.